Hello. Um, so I recently finished some Jobs to be Done interviews and wanted to kind of take a, the time to reflect back on the lessons learned, but also um, the big picture of discovering Jobs to be Done at GitLab um, and wanted to share some of that information. So um, I want to start first, some brief background into the research I just recently did. Um, for Secure and Govern, we use the Jobs to be Done playbook by Jim Callback as a primary source, which a lot of people have read here. Um, we asked, we were just wondering what were the jobs to be done for creating security policies and other related jobs, um, as well as any aspirational jobs. Uh, and the interviews were with 12 people that took place from January to February of this year. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the lessons learned from that, but also just jobs to be done in general. So to do that, first, um, I want to talk about how jobs to be done are more than just a job story. Um, jobs to be done are discovered through interviews. And um, we are finding that jobs to be done are the building blocks for GitLab or a lot of things within GitLab that we've been using. Um, so just to start talking about jobs to be done being more than just a job story. Um, so first, when we were working on everything, we obviously started with job stories. And I looked at the parts of a job story, how to break them down. Um, and I was finding a lot of usefulness in the modularity of it, being able to go to the smaller levels, like with micro jobs and small jobs, as well as if you are in a micro job to move up and to be able to use the job statements kind of interchangeably and to understand like the higher level of workflows. Um, but they didn't provide everything. They weren't completing all of the understanding. Um, and to do that, we really started focusing on a, a job canvas or a job to be done canvas which includes uh, more than just the job story and the um, need statement and the circumstances and the job statement. Um, so the job to be done canvas includes related jobs, emotional jobs and social jobs, as well as the job performer and uh, more detail about the job process. We really saw a lot of information and a lot of usefulness with the job performer, understanding who a job performer is and the different types of job performers and the difference between that and a user persona. Um, and we also had a lot of value in understanding the process, um, using the job to be on canvas, getting down to the micro jobs and then getting all the way up to, it doesn't say here, but aspirational jobs and big jobs and how those relate to each other. Um, we found that seeing all of these things at once really kind of completed the picture more than just a single job story could. Um, and the, the thing that was really helpful, like I said, was moving up and down and especially during discovering the interviews and actually during the research, um, the ability to ask why to move up to, towards the main job and ask how um, to move towards a micro job was really helpful and kind of instrumental in the actual interviews. Um, so to talk about those interviews, I want to talk about how you can discover jobs to be done through interviews. And it's actually not too hard. We found the process relatively easy. Um, and we took a lot of the lessons that we had and applied them into our template, into the handbook. So one of the first things that we started with um, was just to scope the project. And that was actually really important for us to do um, and something we realized that we kind of have skipped in the past. Um, we had to sit down with all of the stakeholders and really understand what is a job that we care about and what is not a job that we care about. Um, we saw this basically after the first like five interviews that the only way we could appropriately determine the scope of the interviews was using the screener and essentially um, making sure to terminate the people that we didn't want to talk to. For us, it happened to be um, network security policies, happened to be using language that were very similar to our security policies for application security development. Uh, so in our screener, we had to include a specific text for people who knew network security policies. So they would select it and then be terminated and not become a participant. Um, but just in general, we really re we realized that the screener was different than most other screeners because it's very generative and open-ended in nature. Um, so we kind of had to be open-ended in nature in the screener as well um, and use the results that they give and actually just talk about them. We asked what were their top one to two jobs and to write a sentence about it. And then we used their own description of their job to figure out if they were in scope for us or if they were out of scope. And we found that was really easy and helpful. Um, to actually talk to the people. Um, it, it was a little challenging at the start. I found that I was feeling very inexperienced and unfamiliar with the, the context. I pretty much felt like I wasn't confident in every answer that was going to be given to me, basically. I knew that the questions I was asking were kind of important, but I wasn't confident in my ability to understand all of the answers. 
But I realized that was actually kind of a core part of the entire experience because jobs to be done are so foundational to how we do things and how we see the workflow. If we don't know it, then we really have no idea what it is. We don't know it at all. And there's very little that we can use to help us understand it without actually talking to the people. So I found um, the first version of my script was actually very, uh, it was too intensive. It, it had too much back and forth and question and answers. And I realized I had to be more uh, general and use a lot more active listening. Um, so I kind of wanted to focus on that specifically because it was very, very helpful in the interviews just to listen more than talk. Um, I found that was the easiest way to collect data as well as to get the things that I wanted. So I was, um, I found some just high level um, active listening techniques, but some that were really helpful for us were asking probing questions and requesting clarification as well as paraphrasing. Basically parroting back everything that they told me in a different way. So that way the conversation went from like an interview with questions and answers to more talking with someone and agreeing on an understanding of something that they knew about um, and really using them as an expert and just asking them questions along their way and getting to know everything. And I felt at the end, if the participant wasn't completely understanding what I was doing in the interview, then it wasn't a good interview and I wasn't doing it right. The whole point is for the interview to explain everything to us. So they have to be more confident than we are at the end and they have to understand what the point of everything was. Um, the last thing I kind of learned was that it is very important to have a note taker. And if you don't have a note taker, go even slower. Um, I found it is possible to do it without a note taker. Um, the interviews generally take one to two months. The data synthesis can take a little bit longer. Um, but I found if I had a note taker, it was a lot easier to um, map the process in a mural and then show it to the participant and have them validate it and ask them questions about it, ask them if it makes sense to them and if they would do anything differently from what we wrote down. Um, and being very deliberate about the language in each step, asking them if if that sounds right to them and if it makes sense. Um, this is the a mural uh, job to be done canvas that's finished um, just as an example. And we put a lot of time mainly in the job process. Um, we focused a lot in what steps made sense together and looking at those steps and then the job performer um, and looking at the commonalities. So common job performers and common steps for those job, job performers. Um, doing that was a really easy way actually to get to the insights we needed. Instead of kind of blowing everything up and making it really complicated, we kind of just focused on the few things that seemed to be the most consistent, most important, and then building everything else from there. Um, and that helped a lot and that was actually really, really useful. Uh, so we found that the more we talked about jobs to be done, the more we understood them as a group and as a section, the more we use them as well and the more we realized that they're used in other things. Um, so one thing, the one of the goals of the jobs to be done canvas and jobs to be done is to do more outcome driven innovation so we can use the jobs to map the priority and importance um, and build towards them. So we can see underserved, appropriately served or overserved um, needs, and we can get at that just by asking two questions that directly came um, from like the job to be done playbook. And um, we just asked the main job and the two questions, and we can have an incremental model for prioritizing and understanding the needs quantitatively, and then using that for our themes and our roadmaps. Uh, so to kind of go into that, um, Secure and Govern has been using themes and roadmaps more the last year. And to, to a good amount of success, we think it's been pretty helpful to just kind of understand things as a whole. Um, and the jobs to be done, we found are really, really tied into that. Having solid jobs to be done that were validated with research was really helpful because one question we kept asking is, how do we know that that job to be done is at the right level? How do we know that it is um, both, it, the workflow is exhaustive, it does everything that the users do, and it's at the right level that it needs to be at because our uh, previous unvalidated jobs, a lot of them were either too wide or too uh, unfocused. They might have been at like a higher level than was needed or even at a lower level. So it could have been asking like uh, a main job would be actually a micro job that would be do this specific step. And it was kind of hard to relate those words into a roadmap. Um, so having well-validated jobs definitely helped for that. And then using them in the themes as well as the roadmaps, it 
made it because we also use other things in the themes as well to collect the information and having the validated jobs we done made it more consistent, made everything more consistent. So all of the non jobs to be done insights also aligned with our jobs to be done. So all of the theme as a whole was more consistent. One of the other things that we saw was really helpful for, um, for jobs to be done to be used for is the category maturity scorecard. Obviously, we ask a number of questions for the category maturity scorecard. And one of the main ones, step zero, actually, for the, the process is to understand the jobs to be done is to use the job statement um, for the survey, the questions that are on the left. Um, and that is how we grade everything. So having the appropriate job level that is validated was really, really helpful for us um, and was super important. And uh, from the research side of things, kind of what made me start this Jobs to be Done research actually was doing the benchmarking. Um, the benchmark takes the workflows that the user does, has various tasks for them to do, and then grades them based off of what how successful they were. And the conversation of shaping what those tasks were and what success was, was very, very, very much revolved around Jobs to be Done. Um, we had to understand their big job, what their main goal was, and what their individual tasks were in order to set up the right success criteria for the benchmarking. And if you don't have the right um, level of jobs to be done or as well detailed as they should be, then it could be a lot harder to map the correct benchmarking and get the results that are actually useful and applicable to a realistic situation. Uh, so just to go over everything again, uh, we found that job story, uh, jobs to be done were more than just a job stories. Uh, having all of the job canvas was really helpful for us. Um, jobs to be done are discovered through interviews and it's not too much. It usually takes about two months or so uh, to talk to everybody and get all of the discovered jobs to be done. And that uh, you can use them for a lot of things, innovation, themes, roadmaps, scorecards, and benchmarking. Um, this research was also so helpful for us. We came up with another hand, what random other things that came out of it, um, including the slide, but also um, the related jobs to be done, more research for another group to validate those jobs to be done. We also had multiple handbook updates. Um, I mentioned earlier the difference between a job performer and a user persona, but the more we have conversations around it, and the more we use jobs to be done, the more we wanted to kind of understand them and clarify them. Uh, and all that was pretty helpful. And then the clips that we actually got from it um, some of the interviews were so helpful by themselves that they were worth it to clip the insights separately from the rest of the, uh, the data and share it individually with people in the Slack group so they can see an example of a user workflow or a user having, user having some needs that weren't really explained in other jobs or other areas of the handbook. Uh, so yeah, that's it. If anyone has any questions. Um, oh, Camelia. Uh, yeah, I have the first question. I just first want to say thank you. I really like the job to be done you do for the policy. It's really helped my work a lot. And the small thing I realized, like for the uh, emotional related thing, we documented are the negative emotion. So I'm just having question, like curious about do people ever talk about positive emotion? Do we think it's valuable to document positive emotion? Because we're some sometimes we're designing something towards the happy path. And if we know what the happy paths from the user are expected, like that's also a good information or maybe it's just too like diverse, depend on people, not sure. Uh, that's a, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think it, um, I can't have research that explicitly knows this, but from my experience, people don't typically bring up positive things naturally quite as much as they would bring up negative things. Um, the, the script that we kind of used from the job to be done playbook also did happen to focus on like things that they didn't like, um, anything that they remember that they would have changed, stuff like that. It tend to ask those questions more. Um, but I don't think that that's just kind of because in the process of how things were done, the focus happens to typically be on things that were a little bit more frustrating, things that they would like to improve. Um, so I don't think that's actually because negative emotions are more prevalent in the job to be done compared to positive emotions. I think in general, the emotional elements are of the lesser prioritized things, just because if we want to understand more about how users feel about a certain thing, there could be other research methods that 
get that data in a more clear and concise way. Whereas the jobs research, it's like a helpful add-on or almost like a cherry on top where it's like, oh, it kind of rounds out the rest of the understanding of the workflow in the job, not necessarily is the main point. So they kind of talked about it less, but I don't think because they liked it less or anything. It's just, I think it's just because they talked about it less. Oh, okay, cool. Thank you for the information. I think like it's really interesting, maybe future to dive into that because sometimes because we design something so logical and our product is uh, like um, technical driven and sometimes we forgot users emotion in the background and those yeah. something good to be easier to step into users shoes. If there are other methods or like if we have time to prioritize those research, I'm very interested. Let me know. Yeah, that's a that's a good idea. To be honest, I actually found it to be kind of hard to ask the question in general because uh, one of the questions like around emotion was uh, every time I gave it, I gave it to somebody in the interviews, they all kind of like stumbled over the question. They all kind of like didn't really know how to answer it initially. Um, and I think it's kind of hard for those people to context switch between their workflow and the logic steps and then their emotions involved. So it could actually be worth just asking them a lot more emotion-based questions and come at it from that perspective the entire time because they would probably be more attuned to it. Cool, thank you. Um, yeah. Pedro, I see you're still typing. I don't know if you want to speak. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. Uh, great, great work. I love this presentation. Um, in particular, I liked how you showed the relationship between uh, job to be done and the different activities or methods that we use in our design process. Um, and uh, I was looking at the jobs to be done page that we have in the handbook, and we only mentioned that link very lightly at the top. So I wonder if there's an opportunity here to expand on that uh, to show how um, jobs to be done are at the core of those uh, activities. I know that you know if you go and look at the um, you know, UX benchmark or um, some other activities, you see jobs to be done mentioned as a requisite, as something that you need to do. But I, I really like seeing this overview uh, that connects these things. So I, um, I wonder if it would be nice to uh, expand on that. Yes, I think it would. Um, I think you're completely right. I even... Um... Earlier today, I showed this to Andy, who was helpful enough in providing me some of the images and like visuals that he created. I realized, looking at him, he even mentioned there's also the category maturity scorecard. And then I went on the handbook page, and I realized step zero is jobs to be done, and that a lot of these will have the jobs to be done importance on those pages, but not on the actual jobs to be done page. So I think you're totally right, and that is definitely exactly. something I'll, I'll, I'll focus on in the next week or two. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because when, when you look at the specific methods, it's yeah. there and you realize, oh, okay, I need jobs to be done. But the jobs to be done themselves, if you notice how how many activities uh, it supports um, in, in our innovation and design practice, I think that strengthens their importance a lot. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Uh, Vika, do you want to voice your comment? Yeah, uh, um, there's some like something strange that I've been experiencing. Um, so jobs to be done is definitely something very helpful. And like Pedro said, it's kind of at the center of everything that we do here. So it's, of course, something very important. Um, and every time I visit, uh, I won't say every time because I visit like pretty often, but every six months, when I look at the documented jobs to be done for my stage group, it feels like it's a little off and requires some correction. And that's when I go back to uh, like, I revisit the um, insights that I received from any recent research that I conducted. And if not, I even have performed a like very foundational research just to kind of redo my, uh, the documented uh, jobs to be done. But I mean, is there any guidance on how to make sure or how to determine the right elevation uh, for the documented jobs to be done? Because, I mean, this process of revisiting every time, it's helpful, but uh, maybe there's something that would um, ensure that the first time we do it, it's uh, like done at the right level. Yeah, I found that was a, a common thing in our group. I actually have a, a 
research with a group to just re-level their jobs, not even rediscover, just to re-level it as a fact. So it is definitely common. Um, I don't think there are handbook pages that speak to this. So I think that's a need that we should probably work on. Um, but something that helped me from the Jobs to be Done playbook was that a job to be done should exist without an, a UI um, or a particular product. The biggest thing is it should be product agnostic and it should, um, if you uh, really, the, the UI thing, and for us, I obviously thought of it in terms of um, our CI, like a job to be done should be able to be completed without any reference to a specific feature on GitLab. And it should be one of the other things I think I think it said was um, it should be able to be done in 50 years or theoretically done in 50 years. I didn't put that in here and I don't think I put that in one of the other slides because I kept actually getting questions on like, how do we know it's 50 years and stuff like that. But I found that that general question, like the jobs should be done, jobs to be done should be valid 10 years from now outside of this UI. Right. And the micro jobs are the things that are changing more regularly, I found. Um, so a big job should be something like gather resources, doing, um, you know, writing a job, doing something general. And then the micro step is actually how they did it in this specific product or how they did it in this specific situation. Um, but a lot of that just came from conversations too with Andy, as well as other people in the stage group, just asking, does this make sense? Does it compare to the other jobs at the right level? Um, I don't know if that helps. I'm sure we can if you have any more questions, it, that's a big thing. So I'm sure we could dive into it deeper in some other place or another issue. Too. Yeah, yeah, we're at and, time. Um, so if we can follow up async okay. or separately, that would be great. But thank you so much, Michael, for your presentation. I'm going to go ahead and stop recording now.